live. Hello everyone. Welcome. I am Christiana Ellis. I am the dungeon master for so many levels, a D&D podcast that we we've been running a continuous campaign from level 1 to level 15. We're at episode uh, we're 92 episodes in of the main campaign. We've run some other stuff in there. And uh, I love making tabletop RPG characters and especially D&D and so I thought let's share the love oh hey smart master welcome you made it for a live installment of character creation hour so we're going to be making a D&D character today and uh, I, I like for this process you know sometimes you have a specific sort of idea for a character in mind but sometimes you let the dice decide and so in that sense what I'm going to be doing is the standard roll 46 subtract the lowest and that's the stats and sometimes when you do that you you choose which stat you want each number to go in but today fate will tell us what our strengths and weaknesses are and then we'll decide what kind of character makes more the most sense for that. So, without further ado, let's roll some dice. Okay, that's a <laughs> that's a inauspicious beginning here. So, if we say one of these ones is the is the low, then we got a two and a four and a one. So our strength for this uh, particular character is going to be seven. That is not, uh, probably we do, will not have a fighter or a barbarian in our future today. <laughs> we'll see. Let's try for dexterity. Okay, that's a little better. If we drop the one, then we've got, okay, well, that's still just a 10. So, you know, average, average, could be worse. Uh, but uh, not not too bad, but we're we're not on uh, a strong start yet, are we? <laughs> Let's see. Okay, so there we got a six. Nice. If we drop that two, got a three and a three and a six. That's going to give us a twelve. Okay. So at the very least, our not very strong average dexterity character is going to at least have. Uh, some hit points to deal with. And let's see how smart they are. Okay, we got a five, a six, and a three. Okay, there we go. Fourteen. That's not so bad. All right. Let's keep going. Wisdom. Do we have a wise character? Ooh, look at that. Six, six, and three. So we got a 15 there. That's pretty good. All right. I'm glad that four, uh, intelligence is not the only uh, high stat because that's in some ways, you know, you can make a good wizard with a high, high intelligence, but if nothing else is good, that's really the only, you know, class that makes any sense. All right, last but not least, okay, that's just going to be another 10. So, average charisma, average charisma. Okay, so, I think then that, you know, as we, as we take a look at these stats, let's go ahead and I'm going to shift over to my D&D uh, &D Beyond character creation screen. I'm not sponsored by them or anything, but I do certainly enjoy their product. So uh, I'm going to just go ahead and, uh, you know, we're going to do the standard character creation screen. Oh, you know what? I should be clicking on the actual screen and not on my video preview. Makes it easier to actually click on things. So obviously we do not yet know what our character is going to be like so we'll go ahead and leave it blank there for now but I like to go ahead and uh, just enable everything um, but so we'll we'll come back on things like name and even race 
but let's just let's talk just a little bit about the stats. So uh, with a, an intelligence of 14, we could do wizard. Uh, but what we could also do is with wisdom, that puts us in the realm where we could perhaps make a cleric or perhaps a druid. And, uh, you know, I think some of the other classes, like a monk, can use uh, wisdom for things, but we also have a relatively low dexterity for a monk. But then once you're talking about what kind of class you want to make, we also have racial bonuses to keep in mind. So that can take stats that were a little weaker and make them a little bit more well-rounded. And, you know, so let's, let's think about what we want. Do you, uh, so... I don't know, maybe, maybe a cleric would be good, um, or a ranger, you know, maybe let's, what do you, so, uh, do you, do you in the chat, I know you're there, smart investor, you have a cleric versus ranger preference or any other suggestion? The druid, the beast shape would take care of the physical. That's true. You know, I keep saying cleric dr ranger, you know, but of course, druid is also very much a, a good uh, choice. So. And what we can also do is make our, we can uh, choose our, a race based on emphasizing, you know, what's going to be the, the biggest strengths. You know, it's always a question of whether you want to try to make your character more well-rounded or just even better at what they're going to do, right? Um, so, yeah, we could do a druid. So if we want a druid, obviously we're going to still try to get wisdom as high as possible. Starting at level one, uh, if we have a race that gives us a plus two to wisdom, that's really not going to be any better for us than a, a race that gives us a plus one to wisdom and something else. Um, but of course, it would also mean that we're only one ability score away, uh, ability score increase away. So, you know, you still have that extra bonus for later. But so let's take a look at what our choices are as far as things that would give us uh, a little bit of a wisdom bump, but then also maybe something else that's going to come in handy. And, you know, there's so many races to choose from anymore. Like, I don't, off the top of my head, remember the racial bonuses for every single one of them. But we can take a look. So I'm pretty sure that um, Furbolg does a wisdom increase and maybe Elf. But let's see. So Tortle does a plus two strength and plus one wisdom. So that plus one wisdom would, you know, would give us a, a 16. And then it would buff out a little bit our our low strength score, make that less of a penalty. So that's one option. Let's see, I think, yeah, Yonti, your Yonti Pureblood, uh, I think Yonti are very cool, um, but uh, it's probably not the optimal thing here. So what is the Warforged do? Constitution, and I think the, I think the different types, um, so, and all of our other, uh, so we have an odd number on strength and odd number on wisdom, but all the others are even. So take that into account too when we are looking at what's going to give us a plus one versus plus two and so on. I think, I think all the Warforged does constitution and, uh, uh, oh, and then the different types. So, but then this type also increases strength by two. It's the, the three different types. So the Envoy one, what was it? It has the plus one constitution, but then also, oh, you can pick two of your choice to each increase by one. So what that could actually do is give us, um, you know, if we get our plus one to constitution naturally, we could put one more in there and have a constitution of 14 and take a, another one and make it a, uh, 15. It kind of, it, it's an interesting idea to do a Warforged Druid. Is that something that even makes sense? It's kind of an interesting idea. I wonder, I feel like for flavor, it might be fun if you were doing a Warforged Druid, that whenever you did a beast shape, you were like a transformer, right? So you, you have sort of your Warforged version of whatever animal you turn in and the, and instead of just like poof or, or, a, you know, a morph into a new one, you have to, that would be kind of fun. That's kind of a cool idea. 
let's let's keep that as on the side as a possibility because that's kind of fun. Which one was this? This was the Envoy Warforged. So let's see what some of our other choices are that we might be comparing that against. The Vidalkin are from the Ravnica, I think. I don't really know. So they get a plus two intelligence and plus one wisdom. So that would potentially work with our stats here. But I don't really know anything about them. They, the blue-skinned Vidalkin strive for perfection above all else. Hmm. Well, the plus two intelligence would make, give us a smart character. Uh, but I don't know that, certainly mechanically, I don't know that we have a whole lot of uh, specific benefit from that. And I don't really know very much about that race. Maybe I should read more about them, but I'm not excited about making a character of that race when I don't really know very much about them. Could research here on the stream, but let's keep looking for now. So let's see, Triton gets plus one strength, constitution, charisma. Hmm, 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 hmm. Uh, the turtle we looked at, um, the turtle was another plus one wisdom, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, tiefling has, I think it's most, wow, there's so many different types of tiefling, tieflings now. Um, I, you know what, I, I'm not feeling a tiefling, not today. Uh, let's see, tabaxi is dexterity and charisma, which, you know, we we don't really need that. Let's see, I keep scrolling to the bottom. Um, an Aarakocra gives plus two dexterity and plus one wisdom. So that would give us our 16 wisdom and then make us a little more dexterous. And that way, it's really only, you know, dexterity is obviously a very useful stat in all sorts of ways, avoiding traps, getting out of the way of spells and so on. Uh, centaur. Centaur plus two strength plus one wisdom. That's kind of like the uh, turtle. Uh, centaur, I don't know, centaur druid certainly seems like, you know, if you wanted to make like the Harry Potter centaurs, right? You know, that's, that could be fun. You know, so far though, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm, I'm not seeing anything. I mean, there's lots of things to choose from, of course. You like Furbolg, of course, gives a plus two wisdom, plus one strength. And Furbolgs have got some really cool stuff that they can do. But I'm not sure anything's exciting me as much as the idea of a Warforged Druid right now. I mean, that just seems like that's kind of what's uh, scratching my itch at the moment, you know, so to speak. Uh, what was the this skirmisher warforged? What it, what it, was their extra? But they get extra dexterity. But so let let's look a bit more at what the the envoy warforged, like what their traits would be. Like if we picked that, what would, um, you know, what would we be dealing with here? So we've got you know warformed formed from a blend of organic and inorganic materials built as weapons they must now find a purpose beyond the war and of course that purpose could be to protect nature you know the natural world you know the idea of uh, it's it's kind of like how you know superman is not human but he chooses to protect the humans cuz he believes in them and all that and so you know a a a, a manufactured creature who nonetheless chooses to side with the natural world. That's kind of a fun idea. There's some nice conflict built right in there. So uh, envoys are built, designed with a certain specialized function in mind. You might be assassin, healer, or an entertainer. The rarest of the Warforged subraces, specialized design. Okay, so most Warforged were built with, uh, built to fight in the last war. The vast majority of Warforged are Juggernauts or Skirmishers. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, as an Envoy, you have a skill, a tool proficiency, and a tool that's part of your body. When you make an Envoy character, consider the following questions. What is your purpose? How does your skill and tool reflect that purpose? And what form does the tool take? So they have like loot, uh, compass rose, uh, with cartographer's tools, an infiltrator with a disguise kit. Yeah, you know, like I'm, I, you know, let's we can maybe come back to that. 
But so if our, our constitution score would increase, so we would, we'd be starting with a 13. Um, the alignment, you know, age and alignment uh, would be between 2 and 30 years old, kind of mixed there. Medium size, of course, nothing, you know, unusual there. But then this Warforged Resilience. So advantage on saving throws against being poisoned and resistance to poison damage. Makes sense. Immune to disease. Don't need to eat, drink, or breathe. You don't need to sleep. Don't suffer the effects of exhaustion due to lack of rest. And magic can't put you to sleep. You know, like all of that, you know, standard robot type stuff. Right? And then so sentries rest... When you take a long rest, must spend at least six hours in an inactive, motionless state. So you're not unconscious, you just need to not move. Okay. Integrated protection, you have built-in defensive layers, which determine your armor class. Gain no benefit from wearing armor, but if you're using a shield, so on. Um, you can alter your body to enter different defensive modes each time you finish a long rest. Interesting. So you can either have the unarmored version, composite plating version, or heavy plating. That's interesting. So if you, you know, the, the, the relative advantages here would be, uh, you know, so with composite plating, let's see, I'm trying to think why Oh, I see. So pre prerequisite. I was trying to see what would be the benefit of being in unarmored versus composite plating, and it's really just that you need whatever class you pick needs to have medium armor proficiency. So either by class or by background. Languages, it's just common, and then uh, two different ability scores of our uh, would increase. And I think as we kind of talked about, we would probably uh, take one of those to bump the constitution up to 14 and then make the wisdom into uh, 16. You gain one skill proficiency of our choice, one tool proficiency, and one language. And the integrated tool. So this is important because this integrated tool needs to reflect whatever this Warforged whatever their original purpose was, right? That's what makes sense that they would have integrated. So it's not necessarily something that would inherently be super useful for a druid uh, because I don't know that we it makes sense for this character to have been made to be a druid, right? Like, were they made to be a druid or had they come to that conclusion on their own. I feel like it makes a little bit more sense if their background is sort of the standard they were made to be like a soldier, but they have broken from that history and decided instead to be uh, navigators tools, spyglass. Okay. Oh, you know what? I, I really like spyglass. I, I like that a lot because immediately what that makes me start thinking is um, that they were, you know, used for like reconnaissance, right? Like they could be put in sort of a remote spy post to watch for things and they didn't need to be supplied with food or drink. They could just stay in one spot for hours and hours and days and days. And that what if during that time using their spyglass, they started looking at the natural world around them, even if that wasn't what they were supposed to be doing. And that's how they started to come to love and appreciate the nature around them. I kind of like that. Now, one thing that we would want to um, probably acknowledge making a character like this is that because the spyglass in standard D&D is a very expensive item, I think they cost 1,000 gold, that means that it's something that like most level one characters would probably not be allowed to start with a spyglass. <laughs> but given that this isn't for a specific, uh, uh, a specific campaign uh, and there's no DM to ask, I really like spyglass. I think that's very cool. And so they have an integrated spyglass and double your proficiency bonus for any ability checks you make with it. Um, must have hands free. Like that's 
Um, well, and so to be sure, it's stolen, but I guess I just mean that like if you were making this for some other person's campaign, you would probably want to make sure they're cool with starting with it just because even if it is stolen, it's a question of balance if, you know, like if you could have any character who's allowed to start with whatever expensive tool they want just because it's stolen. But in this case, there's no one to, uh, yeah. Um, and so, so I would say that uh, it, it's not even a matter of the spyglass being stolen. They themselves are, in a sense, stolen. They have chosen to escape from their original uh, purpose. They, they have stolen themselves by escaping uh, the, the work that they were originally assigned. I, I, think, I think that's very cool. Actually, it just makes me want to just double check right now. I'm going to pull up another tab here and look up what the spyglass does as a mechanical item, as an equipment thing. Okay, so I, I was thinking that it, it did... So objects, objects viewed through a spyglass are magnified to twice the size, and it does cost 1,000 gold. I was thinking it might have had a more specific mechanical effect, but it kind of makes sense that it would be this way. And the reason for that, and I'll, I'll, this actually calls to mind a discussion I had just over the weekend in Balticon. I was talking to a friend who was DMing his own game, and they were talking about a player who was a little frustrated with 5th edition because, to their mind, compared to previous editions, it seemed like anyone could do anything. It used to be, according to them, that you know before you needed to have a balanced party because only certain classes could do certain things now it seems like everybody can kind of do everything and one of the suggestions that i made is that uh you don't give people the chance to roll unless it makes sense that their character could do something for example the idea of using thieves tools right like you can have proficiency in thieves tools and roll to try to pick a lock but realistically if you just hand someone thieves tools they don't have a five percent chance of getting a 20 you know like in real life <laughs> just because someone is able to uh, get lucky doesn't mean that they're suddenly able to pick a complex lock if they've never even practiced with thieves tools before so that's an example where if someone's not trained for thieves tools i usually would not even give them the opportunity to try them unless it could be justified in some other way and so in that context uh, the idea of what does a spyglass do, well, it would be a case where uh, it's, it's not so much a matter that they give you advantage on a perception check or a bonus to a perception check, but a case where the DM would know there would be certain things that you could only see through a spyglass no matter how high you rolled. And so certainly if you were like in a seafaring campaign or any campaign where you're having to look out over long distances, there are going to be some things that you won't be able to see even if you roll a 20 if you're using the naked eye. But maybe if you're using a spyglass, you only have to get a 12 because you've got an assistive tool and it's one that's, uh, you know, a thousand gold. <laughs> I mean, you know, the cost is ridiculous, but it, at the same time, you have to kind of put it in perspective with the rest of the world building. I think the cost of the uh, the cost of the spyglass kind of assumes a certain technology level that doesn't entirely mesh with the existence of Warforged, for example. But you know, in terms of real world, like what it costs to make a spyglass that actually functions, like it's not. You know, you have to be able to grind lenses with fairly uh, high precision. You know, that's not something that a, a low technology society is easily able to do. But in any event, for all the reasons we've already discussed, I really like the flavor of this, you know, kind of like a spy robot who was supposed to always just look at things from afar suddenly 
looking at things he wasn't supposed to be and therefore making uh, falling in love with the natural world and deciding to defect from their their post to protect nature i love that okay so let's go ahead and choose this race then all right so this is just summing up the things that we've selected here but now we have to so choose a tool um, it's not a pull down here so I'm not sure hmm yeah so the pull down doesn't it's yeah something's a little wonky with the interface here I think is that the it doesn't uh, you know it's asking to pick something but it doesn't give us anything to pick from but let's uh, go ahead and choose that well I think druids as a class have medium armor proficiency so I'm gonna go ahead and pick that for the moment composite planning only usable if you're proficient in medium armor and so we'll you know we'll deal with that so our ability score increased we talked about already that we would do constitution and wisdom and we're going to input our rolled dice here in a minute well well yeah so three spy glasses equal in cost to two suits of plate armor but it's a specialized tool right you know it's used for different things um but let's see skill so uh i think that the perception is you know what makes sense based on what we talked about um, so spyglass is not one of the ones that's listed on this you know uh, you know it's not listed in here so we'll have to um, we'll have to improvise that a little bit um, but what we could do is let's see we got a lot of you know, weavers, tools, vehicles, so on. What what makes sense is kind of st our stand-in for that. Um, I don't know, maybe cartographer's tools. That still kind of makes sense. Um, yeah. And then language. Hmm. I think it depends a lot on... Uh, we would want to choose this based on knowledge of what the setting was likely to be, right? And what's the background? Who made this Warforged? Where are they from? What's that all about? But let's go ahead and let's say Gnomish. And then, so yeah, it's, oh, I see, I see. So the reason we can pick Cartographer's Tools now is because it is the integrated tool related to this. So I think what we would have to just do is add in our notes that the this integrated tool includes a spy a spyglass. And that would be something, you know, if you were working with a DM, you would clear with them, but uh, that's not necessary today. So let's move forward. And we already decided we're doing a druid. And yeah, so we do have the medium armor proficiency, so that's what we're going for. So we're going to have our, our D8 level of hit points with, a, with a, a 14 is what we'll be working with. So that's not bad at all. And then, uh, so our proficiencies, we're going to have, you know, pretty simple weapons. But, you know, weapon standard weapon attacks is usually not where druids are, you know, shining. So you know the secret language of druids. Uh, you're gonna have your, we're gonna have our spell casting stuff. The wild shape will get at second level and choose the druid circle at second level. So I think we'll finish making the level one version of the character, but then maybe go ahead and level up to level two because you know picking the druid circle is such a like big piece of uh, of you know what a druid's all about. So with, we get to add two more proficiencies here from the Druid uh, stuff. And uh, I'm going to choose Animal Handling just because, again, I, the, just the image of the robot that likes little animals 
likes cute little animals. I mean, I just think that's very cool. That's kind of what captivates my imagination about this character. So let's see. And then uh, nature. Yeah, I think I think those all make sense. And then so here's, you know, these are the features we would have at level one. And so spells. Um, so we would choose two cantrips and only one prepared spell. Is that right? Oh, you know what? No, I think we come back to that because we have to fix. That's going to be based on. Um, we'll come back to this because it, it's going to be modified based on our our, our uh, ability scores here. So if we're adding in our starting spots here. You know, I'm just thinking that even the very low strength score kind of ties in with this idea that if this if this Warforged was kind of just used for spying, you know, like go stand in this remote place and watch things from a distance, you know, it's not on the front lines, kind of makes sense that it might be a little spindly, right? Let's see, 12, and then 14, 15, and 10. All right, and then so that makes our, our final scores here, 7, you know, 10, pretty standard. We get our 14 constitution from the two separate pieces of our racial modifier. Our intelligence is the same, 14. Our wisdom becomes this 16. Charisma stays at 10. So now if we go back here and look at our spells, yeah, there we go. We can have four prepared spells at level one. So let's look at our cantrips. Uh, Druidcraft obviously is one that, you know, only Druids get. So it seems, you know, like you, you don't ever have to pick any spell, but in some ways, if you want each class to really sort of feel like its own thing, you know, go go with those things that only your class can do. So I kind of I kind of like having that, and it's one of those nice little utility fel uh, spells that can do some of the same things as some other cantrips. But you know, harmless little sensory effect that predicts what the weather will be uh, for the next 24 hours. I feel like I never see anyone use that. That's kind of cool. Um, you can make a flower blossom. That's very cute, and it again fits with this this imagery we could imagine of like robot holding like a little bird in the palm of its hand or making a little flower bloom. Uh, you can sensory effects such as falling leaves, puff of wind, so in light or snuff out a candle or a small campfire. I like all of that stuff. That's all good. So one more one more cantrip here. Let's see. Uh, thunderclap. Let's see. Do we want it to be in? Yeah, I think it's it's always handy to have at least one um, I, I, I like when you're choosing just two cantrips to have one combat and one, uh, one utility. So the, uh, potential combat ones, we don't have Firebolt, which is one of the standard, you know, combat, uh, cantrips to choose from. Uh, welcome. We got a few more people watching. Uh, welcome. We're making a, uh, we're making a Warforged Druid today because why not? Uh, so Thorn Whip, um, I I think is cool in general, but I don't know if it necessarily makes the most most sense for this character. What makes the most sense for this character? You know, they're learning magic, which is not necessarily inherent to their warforged nature, so it doesn't have to match that. But so if we were going to do so, produce flame can be used for combat. Thorn whip can be used for combat. Uh, so. Let's see. Thunderclap is just 1d6 thunder damage to start, um, and it can be everything around you. So that's like good if you have like a lot of stuff around you. Not one of the more optimal ones. Primal Savagery. What is that? I don't know that one. Channel Primal Magic to cause your teeth or fingernails to sharpen, ready to deliver a corrosive attack. Melee Spell Attack. And they take 1d10 acid damage. Interesting. How would that how would that work for the Warforged? Like, I don't know. That's in, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, they'd have to sprout a rose and hand it to a kid. 
Yeah, so like I like this one, but it raises the question. When you have like a humanoid doing it, the the idea of the primal savagery is it's supposed to be like they're reverting to some sort of a more wild element of its, you know, genetic heritage, so to speak. Whereas for the Warforged, like we could certainly imagine the Warforged, you know, me mechanical fingers growing spikes or something like that, and even doing the acid damage. But what would that mean for a Warforged? Is the meaning of it different in a way that's interesting? Hmm. It's one thing to consider. Uh, infestation is such a weird one. Can it cause a cloud of mites, fleas, or other parasites? And they have to make a constitution saving throw. The interesting thing about this one is it's not that much damage because they ha they get a saving throw and then it's still only six one d six poison damage, but then they have to move. They they they're forced to move out of the spot they're in, and that's something where like if you have someone engaged with them, it could like force them to have to take a uh, 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 to take a, a an opportunity attack. Yeah, it is kind of like a partial beast shape, but almost that kind of makes it like less useful in that regard, right? It all, it kind of almost overlaps a little much with that. But then again, you know, you're really only using the wild shape for combat focus if you are a circle of the moon druid, and there are several other choices. I've never seen anyone take infestation or do much with that. Oh, this movement doesn't provoke opportunity attacks, blah. So never mind about what I was just saying there. Um, it just kind of forces something to move. But I feel like the idea that, like, what if this Warforge has, has like, a little swarm of bugs that, like, lives in it? Is that gross? I don't know. Or it could almost be, like, nanobites or nanobots or something like that. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. I'm not... Not, none of these are leaping out at me as feeling great. Um, frostbite. I don't know. You know what? Maybe. Oh, wait. What's this? What's resistance here? Touch one willing creature. It's concentration up to a minute. Once before the spell ends, they can roll a d4 and add the number rolled to a saving throw of its choice. Uh, I feel like that wouldn't come up that often. Shillelagh. Um... Yeah. Um, what that does that's kind of cool, that would be useful. Like, it, it costs an action to do it. So you can't really use it on the first round. But if you were not combat focused with your primal shape, your, your, your you know, beast shape, uh, you can, even with a low strength, you could still be melee you know, competent with a, a staff or something. Hmm. All right. Well, you know what? Let's, even though I haven't fully kind of solidified in my head what it would mean for the character to do primal savagery. Hmm. What that really just does is it just lets them make you know, an effective melee attack, and it does acid damage, which not a lot of things are resistant to. Uh, you know, so if you start fighting things that are resistant to or immune to non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, slashing damage, you can still hurt them with this. Let's go ahead and pick that, and, you know, we can continue thinking about, like, not only just what does it look like when they do that, but is the art like what are they tapping into magically i kind of like it well we'll see we'll we'll see if how we feel about it or if any something else comes up as feeling better so we all also uh, the way spell casting works for druids of course is that they have access to their whole spell list but they can only prepare so many of them per day and then after a long rest uh every time they get uh they get to 
you know, choose from the list every day. So whichever ones we pick right now are only just the ones they would have for the first day and then pick new ones uh, after there's been a long rest. But so let's let's look at these. Um, I think uh, I always like, you know, to have at least a little bit of, of healing in there. Uh, animal friendship seems on you know on track with some of the stuff that we talked about it lets you convince a beast that it means you no harm um, let's see oh and it like it actually charms the animal if they succeed on a wis if they don't succeed on a wisdom saving throw but I kind of worked on the animal handling already this feels like it's overlap with that yeah, I don't know. Be well, beast bond. What is that? Establish telepathic telepathic link with one beast you touch that is friendly to you or charmed by you. Fails if the beast's intelligence is too high. And until it ends, the link is active when you're within sight of each other. Through the link, the beast can understand your telepathic messages. It can telepathically communicate simple emotions and concepts back to you. And when the link is active, the beast gains advantage on attack rolls against any creature within five feet of you that you can see. I like that. I like that. I'm going to pick that one. Um, yeah, maybe maybe they, uh, maybe they some of their, the way that they manage to access this druidic magic is some kind of a connection to the fae. Like maybe they just viewed nature sort of longingly from afar and then you know some uh some uh fey lord or lady uh witnessed that and took pity on them and granted them you know access to this natural magic so let's see what else we got here that would be interesting for this you know speak with animals does that make more sense than the beast bond i don't know I don't know. I kind of like the, uh, the the beast bond feels feels different. And then let's see, we can get you know a nice ice knife. Entangle. Entangle is a good classic druid spell. And yeah, let's go ahead and pick those as our our initial four here. So let's keep moving forward. Okay, so. We need to pick a background and uh, you know as we kind of talked about well so criminal slash spy it's, it's kind of a weird like combination thing I'm not sure if that really so what's the feature for that it would be criminal contact hmm hmm that doesn't really feel like it fits quite what we were talking about so let's see. It could be soldier. And they're they have military rank. But they're kind of a runaway. Outlander. In you know, inheritor. Haunted one. Let's see. Some of these. Far traveler. So certainly if you're in a campaign where Warforged are not all over the place. Um, yeah, you can definitely do like homebrew uh, uh, homebrew stuff. We absolutely could. Um, I think for now, I'm just, you know, I think if we were making this for an actual campaign, we might make a specific one that ties in directly. Uh, defector, yeah, yeah. Um, I think the like any of these could be made to fit right like even or even soldier with a military rank i mean part of what might we could do with that is that um soldiers loyal to your formal military organization will recognize your authority and influence they defer to you if they're of a lower rank like that would be something where it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? Like you, you might have people who don't know that you defected, that you could manipulate with your knowledge of their, uh, of their protocols and so on. Uh, but then of course, if anyone does find out who you are and that you defected, it could all turn. That could actually be fun. Um, and so we would also get land vehicles. It's one of the only ways to get land vehicles. 
Hmm, let me just keep looking a little bit. There might be one more that does, you know, anthropologist, archaeologist. Because the, the spy is kind of, well, let's, let's look again at spy. You know, criminal contact is not necessarily what we would want. Yeah, well, so let's see. Unlock all official options in the, you know, so that's not it. We could do, uh, we could find homebrew ones if we wanted. Actually, did I? Yeah, homebrew is activated. Um, oops. I don't know how to, how to like, oh, custom. Oh, well, custom. I don't, what was I doing? Of course. Um, so, okay. Yeah, let's do, do yeah, custom. Okay, and then um, once a re recon spy for an organization, uh, military, yeah, if I can't type. Um, and then Interesting. Seems like that's the, still just kind of the same list. Oh, oh, I see. What that's doing is it's just kind of uh, letting you sort of mix and match. You can't see the drop down. Oh, interesting. The drop down menu doesn't show on the screen. I wonder why that is. Uh, I bet it's because the browser thinks of it as a different window and my my video software is pulling you know the window um, in any event though what this is, seems to be doing is it's just letting me sort of mix and match from the different you know the other options you know so what i'm seeing in the you know in the choices here is just the lists of the other backgrounds actually hang on one of these is smuggler um, what does the smuggler one do? Down low, acquainted with a network of smugglers willing to help you out of tight situations. No, that's that's not quite right either. Okay, back to custom. Uh, yeah. So, I'm going to call it defector. And um, I think that we could make the background feature be that they're, they're maybe not the only one. Like maybe this this military organization um, kind of you know went went a little uh, uh, awry, and there's maybe others that are sympathetic to defectors for it. Yeah, maybe the Outlanders feature would be uh, a good one that we could use. Um, Haunted one is also like it's. That's, that's, I like, I like that feature where it's basically people can just look at you and see that you've seen some stuff. So they want to be nice to you because you like, you look like you've had a hard time. Um, the outlander feature, uh, is pretty good though, I think. So, and then we can, uh, choose to have two skills and two tools, two skills and two languages, or two skills to one tool and one language. I think two skills and two languages makes sense to me. Um, so that's what I'm picking. And then background characteristics. I, I feel like I don't know. I'm, I'm going to pick Outlander again on the, on this list just because actually I'm not sure how this works exactly. So I'm saying deflected, defected from a military that was being led to destruction from poor leadership and unnecessary violence uh, other defections can understand and will protect 
other defectors, not defections. Okay, so, all right. And here we can choose skills. Okay, yeah. So I think that um, stealth makes sense for, for what we've talked about for sure. And then um, insights, uh, investigation. Yeah, I think those, and then languages, we'll let's just go ahead and, I don't know, dwarvish and goblin. I think that uh, if we were going to be playing in someone else's campaign, we would probably want to know a little bit more about the world to decide what it makes the most sense. And so because we chose Wanderer for the feature, this excellent memory for maps and geography, and you can always recall the general layout. Yeah, that actually makes perfect sense. That was an excellent suggestion. And so we could choose from some of these uh, traits, but... Um, you know, so let's see if we have any of these that make sense. Um, I was in fact raised by wolves is kind of funny, but that's probably not really what we're dealing with here for this character. More comfortable around animals than people. That seems definitely appropriate. Always picking things up, absolutely fiz fiddling with them. No place, no stock in wealthy or well-mannered folk. Lesson for every situation drawn from observing nature. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I like that. Then ideals change. Life is like the seasons and constant change must change with it. Greater good, responsibility to make the most happiness, honor, might, nature. The natural world is more important than all the constructs of a civilization. Yeah, there we go. Bonds and injury to the unspoiled wilderness of my home is an injury to me. Um, let's see. I think, yeah, I think. That makes the most sense. Flaws. Uh, let's see. Too enamored of ale wine and another intoxicants. That doesn't make sense. Uh, no room for caution. Mm. Remember every insult. Slow to trust members of other races, tribes, and societies. Violence is my answer to almost any challenge. Don't expect me to save those who can't save themselves. I think slow to trust maybe makes the most sense there. Although, certainly, when we talk about starting a new campaign, slow to trust as a personality trait might actually make for a really good character, but you have to make sure that you're not just causing trouble for the campaign by making a character that won't want to actually join up with the party and has to be dragged into actually doing anything, because that's just no fun for anybody. All right. So, uh, we've got character details and I think that you know uh, the na you know the nature there seems to be a little bit uh, I'm gonna go on the side of chaotic good because you could certainly do chaotic neutral but that starts you know people start to get worried about that that you're gonna just do you know random stuff um, uh, worships the natural world. Um, uh, lifestyle. I mean, that doesn't seem super meaningful for like, for this type of setup. Physical characteristics, um, none, no hair, skin, metal, um, eyes, uh, glowing green. Height, uh, you know, 5'10". Weight, um, I, I don't know what Warforged way. Um, age, 18. Uh, neutral. No gender for Warforged. I mean, they can, but don't have to. Neutral good uh, could work too, but I tend to think that uh, of, of being more in keeping with nature is a little bit moving away from, like, laws and other sorts of imposed structure on the natural world. But I could definitely see it be flavored that way uh, as neutral good as well. So I think, you know, obviously we could fill in more detail here, but let's just briefly say, you know, backstory, 
was once a recon spy set to observe from a distance for long periods but started looking at nature instead and came to love the natural world more than they ever cared about their um, original function. Granted, natural magic. I don't, I, I feel like you don't want to get too prescriptive here um, by a mysterious figure. Right? Like you don't necessarily want to say too much about what it is because that's the, a perfect example of something that you could work out uh, uh, some backstory fun with the DM of like, do they want to include that in the campaign? Something about that, who, who that was, finding out who it was, you know, that sort of thing. All right, so let's let's uh, think about uh, Warforged names. Um, do we let's let's pull up here that races. Is there a let's look at the the thing for Warforged. Let's see if it suggests you know how they how they name each other. Uh, I scrolled past it. I think there we go. Or forged personalities. Oh, and they have quirks. Uh, War forged names. Okay. Uh, numerical designations. Many of them adopt nicknames. Um, okay, they seem to be like one syllable words that are kind of symbolic. Hmm. And it's a, a way to express their path in life. So we could imagine that they had some other name. Sight? Sight is good. Yeah. Or vision. <laughs> you know, but uh, vision's taken. Uh, yeah, sight. Yeah, sure, why not? Sight. All right. And then we have uh, some little, we've got some standard Warforged icons to choose from. Oh, this one's got a little owl on him. Yeah. Or uh, is that an owl? Or it's like a little monkey or something. But sure, why not? It's got an animal. All right, so starting equipment, we would get, you know, a simple weapon, like a staff, I guess, like a quarter staff seems like a good one. And another simple weapon, um sickle and then they get uh, druidic focus um, that they you know the druidic focus is, um, hmm a u1 wooden staff I think the wooden staff we could just make that you know the the we could state that this quarter staff is also the you know the other one watch is also good hmm as a name watch yeah you know I like that I like that more all right um, I think I yeah okay I just ended up unchecking stuff there we go uh, quarter staff skull and then um, that's what they, and they also have an explorer's pack, so we can go add, add that, and then starting, uh, equipment. Oh, I didn't, uh, uh, it didn't, okay, I, I skipped the, it made me skip the thing where I said how much currency was supposed to start with, but I don't have my, uh, here, let me uh, pull that up. So that was from the 
player's handbook has that. Um, starting equipment and wealth. Druid would roll 2d4 and have that times 10 GP. So let's go ahead and we'll get some d4. So I'm not switching this, the camera right now, but I got a, a 1 <laughs> and a 2. So that's going to be 30 gold to start with. Um, Thirty gold. Okay. All right. So, here's our our character sheet, our initial character sheet for Watch. And uh, we've got you know all of our our stuff here. We got our skills. I've got the screen kind of narrowed a little bit. I would more normally have a uh, oh another ten for the background. Uh, well, I could certainly do that. Um, but uh, so let's see equipment. Yeah, we could uh, add ten. There we go. But uh, you know, so now that we've got the, we could go ahead and equip. Oh, you know what? The leather armor actually doesn't make sense because our AC is actually already like assumes the medium armor because the Warforged thing. We'll go ahead and equip the weapons though. And then so we have our our actions. So our quarterstaff and sickle are definitely not, you know, our 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 thing. <laughs> we would not really be using those very much. Uh, but we have ice knife, you know, for that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, primal savagery as a cantrip, so that would probably be what this character would be doing. In that sort, you know what? I wonder. I wonder. Yeah, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna retrofit the weapon choices here because it makes sense to give them if we can uh, a some kind of a some kind of a a, a starting. We want to have some kind of a some ranged weapon that doesn't take a spell slot. So if that's just a sling or so a wooden shield, any simple weapon are 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 slings simple weapons? I think they are. Uh, equipment, weapons. Uh, so we've got simple melee weapons, simple ranged weapons. Yeah, okay, or a short bow. Yeah, a short bow. So let I think we give them a short bow. Yeah. So we we could do that and uh, inventory. We can remove the sickle and then add short bow. That way we just have, you know, something for them to do. Uh, bow. What is happening right now? Why is it not? I'm trying to just add a weapon. That's weird. Okay, I don't know. I've, some of this is a little bit wonky right now. Can I not add it? Okay, I can add a sling, so we'll do that. All right. So, now we've got a sling. Um, but let's, let's talk a little bit before we finish up about going to... Uh, level two and and choosing a druid circle. Because that's that's a big decision for any druid character. And there are so many to choose from. 
One of the standard ones that a lot of people pick, of course, is Circle of the Moon because what that does is it gives you, it makes your wild shape animal forms much more powerful and much more combat focused, which is definitely great, but there are so many others to choose from. So let's maybe look a little bit at what those choices would be. So like Circle of the Land, often those are focused on you get different spells but there are a few other things that they can do so let's see let's look at circle of the land and, and see what what that a lot gives us so circle spells uh, we would have to so depending on which land circle we picked we would get access to these different spells at different levels so if we were arctic we would get these for forest bark skin spider climb call lightning plant growth so on wild shape improvement at fourth level you can um, oh you know so not all of those are uh, so land stride is a, a one where you get to move through non magical difficult terrain with with no extra movement nature's ward can't be charmed or frightened by elementals or fey Hmm. You know what? Let me. I'm gonna pull pull up the the druid circles uh, on on this screen just because I feel like it formats it a little bit better in terms of seeing what the differences between the different circles are. So there's the circle of dreams here, where you get balm of the summer court is is just like a little bit of a of a, like a, an extra healing thing. A, fool, a pool of fey energy. Uh, in some ways, this circle of dreams uh, could tie into this idea that we were granted this magic uh, by the fey, and so that's that's kind of fun. Let's so let's maybe look at this a little bit more carefully here. So, blessings of the summer court. You have pool of fey energy represented by a number of d6 is equal to your druid level. So we would have two at the start when we pick the circle. And you can choose one person within 120 feet of you. Spend those dice, roll them, um, and they gain that many more hit points. And so that's also, uh, target also gains one temporary hit point per die spent. That would be an excellent thing within 120 feet of you. That's a great way to like bring someone up from unconscious, for example, if they're far away. Then at sixth level, we would get Hearth of Moonlight and Shadow. Home can be wherever you are during a short or long rest. Invoke the shadowy power of the gloaming court to guard your respite. Touch a point in space and an invisible 30-foot radius sphere of magic appears centered on that point. Total cover, you get plus 5 bonus to stealth and, and perception checks. Any light from flames isn't visible from without it. That's pretty cool. And then at level 10, hidden paths. Uh, you can use hidden magical paths to traverse space in the blink of an eye. You can teleport up to 60 feet to an unoccupied space. Or you can teleport one willing creature to an unoccupied space. So you can teleport yourself 60 feet, or you could touch a willing ally and teleport them 30 feet. That's kind of neat. Um, and you can use that up to your wisdom modifier. That one's pretty cool. So let's see what the other choices are. So at 14th level, if we got that high, you can travel mentally or physically through dreamlands. Oh, okay. You can when you finish a short rest, you can cast Dream, Scrying, or Teleportation Circle. Oh, and the Teleportation Circle can take you instead of to a regular circle. It takes you to the last place you finished a long rest. That's neat. That's pretty neat. Okay, so let's see what Circle of Spores would do. Um, you get so you get some new spells. Halo of spores. You're sur surrounded by invisible necrotic spores that are harmless unless you unleash them. When a creature is within 10 feet of you, you can use your reaction to do dam necrotic damage to them. It's not a lot, but uh, it, it increases as you get higher, and it would be anything within 10 feet of you. That would be really cool for flavor in certain types of characters, but I'm not sure if it really fits perfectly with this character that we're imagining here. Um, but let's see, you can channel magic into it too. 
can use expend the use of your wild shape to awaken the spores and then instead of turning into a form you get temporary hit, hit points for the spores interesting and you do extra poison it some of those are really cool but I don't think it really fits with what we've been imagining here so the other thing yeah see this is the thing that I was not picking out on the other screen so if we were a circle of the land even no matter which one we pick you can meditate during a short rest and it and recover some spell slots kind of like the arcane recovery for a wizard and so that is makes makes your character because you don't have the same level of uh, combat focus on your wild shape as as others uh, other you know a circle of the moon druid but you you can regain some of your your spell slots let's just scroll and we've got circle of the moon which you know is basically all about making your wild shape badass circle of the shepherd is otherwise known as annoy your dm by summoning and conjuring animals lots of times <laughs> um can you oh you gain the ability to converse with beasts and many fae uh, beasts can understand your speech and you gain the ability to decipher them. So that's, that's fun. I do like that. You also get spirit totem, call forth nature spirits, and magically summon an corporeal spirit, create a 30 foot radius. Um, and what does it do? So you can have it be a bear spirit where it gives you everyone temporary hit points equal to five plus druid level. An advantage on strength checks and saving throw while in the aura. Very nice. You can and you can move it, or you get. Okay, and so do you? Can you choose which aura it is every time, or do you pick one? Um, so if it's hawk spirit, then everyone you and your allies would have advantage on perception checks. That seems like it would be something that's kind of in line with what we are talking about. Unicorn spirit would be advantage on ability checks made to detect creatures in the spirit's aura. Also your mighty summoner. So when you do conjure animals, they're tougher. But yeah, I think, I think after looking at all those choices, that circle of dreams does feel like it kind of aligns the most with all the other pieces of the character that we envisioned. So if we go and we're just at our our level two, if we pick circle of dreams. So we're going to have this balm of the summer court uh, at second level, our wild shape. We're still going to be limited to, um, uh, CR, uh, max CR. So you can still do just like, like small animals that might be able to help a little bit in combat. Uh, but a lot of a lot of what's really useful for uh, for this low level stuff is just being able to sort of disguise yourself uh, and go places in you know in the form of an animal where you might be uh, you might be able to get in places you wouldn't otherwise. And then you have of course this uh, this extra bit of healing that you can do for people. Yeah. Okay, so I think, oh, and, uh, and now that we've done that, now that we're a level two, we, we can pick, you know, we can have one more spell prepared. I think we're still only, yeah, still only can do level one, but uh, let's see if we have one more that seems really fun uh, for this. Um, druids can do ritual casting, right? Um, I think so. All right. So you, you don't necessarily need to have those prepared if, unless you want to be able to cast them in a hurry. Fog cloud is good. Earth tremor. Charm person. Um, you know what? Let's just go ahead and do... You know what? Snare seems fun to me. Like I, you know, that's just another one I don't feel like I see anyone do. 
but you can do it it takes a minute to cast so it's not great for doing it in the middle of um oh you need it to, needs to be prepared are you sure about that i mean i let me because i want to just uh double check that because this is a rule that i sometimes um am confused by because it's let's see uh, because it doesn't, it's not necessarily consistent between all the different classes. Um, ritual casting. You can cast and you have the spell prepared. Yep, you're right. I think there are some, uh, some classes where it, work, it works a little differently. So it's always good to double check. But snare, I think, is an interesting spell where it takes a minute to cast. So it's not like a combat spell. It's something you do in advance. But... Uh, if it's this nearly invisible, it requires an investigation check to spot it ahead ahead of time. And then if they make a dex if they fail the dexterity saving throw, magically hoists an enemy upside down into the air, and then they're restrained there until the spell ends. They they can try to uh, make another saving throw um, on each of their turns, but I think that just feels like I I you know it would be very situational. But boy, you know, uh, in, in those situations, it would be an awful lot of fun. And since, you know, druids can just change them up every day anyway, I think I'll pick that one for now. Um, yes, you're right. Wizards just need their book. I'm about to sneeze. One second. Um, also, I believe that uh, warlocks can choose. There's an invocation that they can pick. And then I think there's also some feats that will let you uh, have like a ritual book um, but all right so we have now created watch the the warforged druid very cool uh, I and and as we discussed when I originally you know we originally brought up the combination I like to imagine that they are like transformer version of the animals although you know that does raise an interesting question i was just talking about the utility excuse me of beast shape where like oh you turn into a cat and use that to get in somewhere where a cat would you know no one would give it a second look but they would be looking for a humanoid but if you look like a robot cat i don't know maybe maybe you only look like a robot cat like up close like, you know, at a glance, um, people wouldn't be able to tell. That would probably be something, if you're playing this in, in a campaign, you would need to kind of work that out with the DM. You know, like, how much of it is cool for flavor that you look like a robotic version of that animal versus the utility of being, you know, uh, uh, you know, no one can tell. <laughs> so, in any event, though, uh, now we have created Watch the Warforged Druid, which is got so many interesting ways that that character could go, I think. Uh, but in any event, uh, thank you for uh, joining me for uh, Character Creation Hour. I, I like making tabletop RPG characters. Uh, I hope you do too. And uh, in the meantime, tomorrow uh, we will be returning with so many levels. The Heroes of Legend will be continuing their adventure as they all teleport into the elemental plane of air, hoping to steal a Githy Yankee pirate ship and infiltrate the Astral Sea. So it should be fun. All right. And I'll talk to you uh, all. I'll uh, see you all then for more adventure on so many levels.